Let me tell you a little bit about how I uh, got into this uh, topic. Uh, back in the 1980s, I was working on the history of Pennsylvania and I was working in the state archives down in Harrisburg. Um, the archives are a wonderful site, they're a wonderful uh, resource. And um, I was looking in the archives of the state police, okay? And I saw one line which said, records of Pennsylvania Ku Klux Klan. I said, that, that sounds interesting. So I filled in one of these uh, slips and I said, yeah, I'd like to see this item. And uh, uh, half an hour later, um, a pair of gentlemen uh, wheeled um, a very large cart in with about a dozen large boxes on. And they said, uh, uh, Bob is right behind with a second cart and we can get the rest of the stuff to you later. And I thought, what, what is happening here? Uh, to cut a long story short, um, there was a time when the Ku Klux Klan was a very, very big deal in the state of Pennsylvania, just how big I'll say in a moment. Um, it reached its height in the early and mid uh, 1920s when it probably had a strength of around a quarter of a million uh, in Pennsylvania, when the um, city in the US with the largest number of Klansmen was, well, where, where do you think? Uh, somewhere in Alabama or uh, Mississippi? No, it was Altoona, Pennsylvania. Um, and um, again, so what were all these uh, archives? In 1940, the Klan had a major faction feud and some people went one way and some people went another way. And one group uh, burgled the headquarters of the other group, took all the records, uh, and dropped them off at the headquarters of the Pennsylvania State Police in Hershey. Now, normally when uh, an, uh, an archive has a lot of uh, records that might be embarrassing, they carefully find out what they can and can't release. In this case, they didn't. So when they made these available to the public, you got everything. You got almost literally where the bodies are buried. Uh, and so I have literally the names and addresses and occupations and height and weight of uh, everyone who was in the Klan in Pennsylvania in that era. So being a professor, what do you do? You go off and publish a book. And I, uh, I published this book called uh, Hoods and Shirts, and I'll, I'll explain what that was in a moment. Um, but it grew out of the, uh, the Klan archives. And well, let me say a few things about this. <clears throat> First of all, the Ku Klux Klan was originally uh, very much a southern movement. It uh, emerged in the late 1860s to fight against reconstruction, to um, uh, really fight against any form of racial equality, and it was entirely motivated by racial hatred. Uh, their language was very explicitly, it was of uh, white supremacy. The Klan was then suppressed partly because it had achieved most of its goals in the 1870s. It went away and it came back in 1915 for a very interesting reason, which was a man called D.W. Griffith made a film called uh, Birth of the Nation in which he depicted um, Reconstruction and presented the Klan in a very heroic mold. People were inspired by this movie to go off and reform the Klan, which they did in 1915. And its success was incredible. Probably at its height, it had 5 million members nationwide. And please remember, that was at a time when the population of the US was about a third of what it is now. But a couple of big differences. This Klan was much more a northern, <clears throat> pardon me, than a southern. Uh, operation. And in the North, it was very heavily motivated not by racial hatred, but by religious hatred. Now, if you were a Klansman in Pennsylvania in, say, 1924, you certainly uh, despised Black people. You were deeply suspicious of Jews. But absolutely the main reason why you were there was because you feared and hated Roman Catholics. 
And if you think about it, between 1890 and 1920, the population of the US changes very dramatically, all these immigrants coming in from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, from Slavic countries, from uh, Italy, and of course, uh, uh, Jews coming in. Um, and those Catholic populations especially grow very fast. And if you are a white Protestant of British or German uh, origin, this for you is a kind of ultimate nightmare and the clan represents an organization that uh, defends white protestant supremacy and the emphasis is on the protestant not the uh, uh not the white um just how rapidly the clan spreads in pennsylvania specifically is very hard to uh exaggerate um between 1922 and 1925, they, uh, they formed 435 lodges, uh, that term. Um, I use the analogy there, as they do, of Masonic lodges. So many uh, regular people at this time are members of the Freemasons and so many other fraternal orders, which are completely you know, innocent, honest, above board uh, uh, organizations. But people get the habit of belonging to these fraternal organizations, and that spills over into the, uh, the clan. So if you're a member of the Masons and the Elks and uh, all these other groups, why not add another one? The clan is very, very successful at, um, at building on this. There are 435 of these lodges, they call them clavens, everything they do starts with k so it's clavin uh it, it's it, it's a long story um many of these lodges would have 2000 3000 uh, members and if you map where they are you are dealing with a map of two things one is industrial pennsylvania so if you look at the rail industry the uh steel industry um then you have areas where the whole workplace is a clan uh, workplace. All the skilled workers, all the uh, foremen are, are, are going to be in the, uh, in the clan. The low paid manual workers are going to be Catholics and they are the, uh, the enemy. And uh, also in uh, white suburbs um, around, um, uh, around Philadelphia, especially, but also around Pittsburgh. So there are a few things which may be run against our expectations here. And the first one is, you might think, why on earth uh, in an area with really quite a small black population at this point, why, is the, why does the clan emerge? Why does it have this very strong uh, you know, racial uh, emphasis? And the answer is it doesn't. It is overwhelmingly a, uh, a religious organization and the literature they circulate is nightmare conspiracy literature about what the Pope will do if the Pope takes over uh, in, uh, in America. Uh, the Klan is an extremely uh, public organization. Uh, it holds very substantial um, public events. They are very good at uh, glitz and uh, uh, razzmatazz, don't forget the 1920s is a great age of, uh, uh, of cinema and uh, movies. This is an organization that grows out of the movies. Uh, they, they are very good at this uh, pageantry and um, the, their greatest um, concern at this point is not getting members, it's keeping members away. There are so many people uh, who want to join for, you know, it's, um, all the cool kids are, uh, are doing it. Um, th this is a photo that um, I really like, and it actually brings up one point which I think is rather surprising. Uh, the first thing it shows you is that um, instead of being very rigid uniforms, a lot of people kind of invent their own uniforms. But the other one is, look at all these women. Uh, and the clan draws very heavily on women members, and something that I find very surprising I've been talking about Klan's men. I shouldn't, because the Klan is the first organization in the US to invent gender neutral terminology. And what you see in front of you are Klan's persons. And that sounds like a bad joke, but no, these are Klan's persons. 
The other thing is that the clan present themselves in a very progressive way. I don't mean progressive as we use the term today, but back in the term of the 19 teens and 20s, they believe in civic improvement. They believe in uh, women's rights. They believe in um, uh, th this um, Protestant noble idea of, uh, uh, of womanhood and, uh, uh, and gender roles. Uh, they believe very strongly in um, prohibition, partly because that sets them against Catholics, um, but also because that's a way of reaching out to women who believe in these kind of improving ideals. So you can look at some of the things that the Klan believes and say, this, this sounds good, this sounds sensible. And then of course you realize the uh, underlying uh, belief system, which is based on hatred and exclusion and discrimination, but it's a complex package. And this also explains a little bit why they get so many members in such a short uh, time. Many people join because they're attracted by the imagery. They like the idea of this noble organization that represents this kind of forward-looking uh, um, progressive America and they're in the group for three months and they realize that there's a lot of bad stuff going on and there's a lot of gangsterism and there's a lot of uh, violence and uh, vigilantism and they drop out. I have talked in the last 20 years to so many people who've uh, told me about the experiences of their grandparents, their great-grandparents who, who went through this. Uh, and often what happens is um, people are going through granddad's closet after he died and they find clan robes and they think, what on earth is this? And when you get down to it, you realize that these are people who would have um, signed up, joined the organization, paid the subscriptions, paid the fees, hung around for three months and dropped out. Oh, the other large group in the organization was clergy. If you think of a small or medium-sized Pennsylvania town at this point, uh, and you look at the Protestant churches, uh, <clears throat> the mainline Protestant churches, the uh, anything with a, a, a German uh, background, old stock uh, Protestant, it is highly likely that those clergy were affiliated to uh, the Klan. Uh, very likely for a, a, a short time. Um, so. Uh, the numbers themselves are they're kind of interesting, they're, uh, they're impressive, and they're startling, but do not take them too far. In 1924-25, there are a series of really horrendous uh, scandals that affect the Klan uh, leadership, there are corruption scandals, and they lose members. They probably go from Okay, I, I wouldn't defend this number precisely, but in Pennsylvania, probably from like 250,000 members to 20 or 30,000 members, they lose maybe 90% of their um, adherents uh, uh, very shortly. Um, and, you know, in, in their early days, uh, the, the, the popularity um, is, uh, is incredible. As I say, this is uh, a, a, a newspaper, absolutely typical that you see at the time. This is 40 Fort in uh, Pennsylvania. In uh, uh, Luzerne, Luzerne, uh, Luzerne County is a huge uh, clan center. And uh, look what happens. Absolutely uh, public um, clan parade. Uh, they're wearing their masks, um, which they wouldn't be allowed to do later. And thousands and tens of thousands of people come out to see them because they're fascinated. Roll the film on a couple of years later and they have become a scary uh, organization. In some ways, to understand the Klan, it's a Ponzi scheme, in the sense that if I were a member, then I pay my dues and my subscriptions. I recruit you, and you pay subscriptions via me, and money gets stuck to my sticky fingers all the, all the way through. It's sort of a Ponzi scheme. Um, and some of the corruption scandals by about 1925 are horrific. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, it, it's just hard to exaggerate how ubiquitous 
uh, the uh, the clan is, how everyone's got their stories of you know burning uh, burning crosses and so on. This is uh, uh, Pike County. Uh, you notice the amount of concealment here, which is nil. Uh, the, these people are extremely uh, you know proud and happy to be uh, be there. Um, this is one of the great uh, clan uh, centers. This is Newcastle, uh, PA. Um, what the clan is uh, really good at is things like um, um, ham suppers, social events. Think of the things that the fraternal organizations and churches are really uh, strong on, and they do it. They will gather 5,000, 10,000 people for, uh, for glorified picnics. That's a lot of the appeal. People sign up for that. They don't sign up for this. By 1924, uh, 25, you're not only getting the corruption scandals, you are getting riots. Uh, the Klan marches in Irish and Catholic areas. The local people react. In this case, uh, in Lilly, Pennsylvania, they turn a fire hose on the Klan. The Klan respond with firearms and people are killed. And as you see, there are riot victims. So think you're kind of a respectable person. You've heard of this thing called the Klan. I must join it. And then you realize, no, it's riots. It, it's corruption. It's gangsterism. You know, we hear so much about the uh, gangsters of the 1920s. This is a gangster operation, basically. But for a couple of years, it does a very good job of concealing uh, what they're up to. They come back in 1928 in uh, a big way. Simple reason for that. In 1928, the Democratic Party runs a Catholic for the presidency in uh, Al Smith. And thousands and thousands of Protestant Americans rejoin the Klan. You see all the flaming uh, torches burning on the uh, mountaintops again, as they had a couple of years uh, earlier. Um, but Al Smith is, uh, is defeated and the, the problem goes, uh, goes away. Of the 435 Clavens, lodges, maybe, maybe 30 are left. There are some centers. Uh, Philadelphia suburbs are quite strong. There's a few around uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Wilkesbury has an extremely strong uh, clavin uh, all the way through. Um, so, some uh, mid sized uh, towns, they operate through the 20s and 30s, uh, but they're way, way past their glory days. Um, and that's the end of the story. No, it's not the end of the story for this reason. Um, for several years, American politics come to be totally fixated on the ideas of the crash, uh, the Great Depression, the, uh, uh, the New Deal. Uh, people try and um, survive this and the old ethnic politics really fade, the old Protestant Catholic uh, tensions. But new forces arise and Pennsylvania is going to be absolutely central to them. And I believe I'm right in saying that uh, some of these stories that I'm going to tell will be a little bit surprising. Long story short, uh, through the 1930s, there is intense uh, influence of fascist and Nazi movements in the United States. And remember the title of my book is Hoods, well that's the Klan obviously, and Shirts. And these Nazi and fascist groups, what are they in Europe? They're black shirts, they're brown shirts, they're orange shirts, whatever. There are shirt movements everywhere in Pennsylvania. And from just having the Klan, you have a range of Nazi and fascist movements, which are focused on one main cause, which is Jews and Judaism. They are anti-Semitic uh, movements. So who are some of these? One of them has been wholly forgotten, but it is so important at the time. There's a man called William Dudley Pelly, who is a great uh, mystic. He is an occultist. He has these great uh, visions and publishes all these mystical books. And in January 1933, the day that uh, Hitler takes power in Germany, he founds his own American movement, an anti-Semitic movement called the Silver 
shirts. <clears throat> and uh, they're meant to be silver, they're meant to have this kind of very occult uh, quality. And the silver shirts become extremely powerful across the United States. They're very strong in uh, Pennsylvania. They have a big uh, foothold in, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. So think who makes up uh, Pennsylvania in terms of population. There are uh, many, many thousands of Italians. A great many of those sympathize with the Italian fascist movement and they join American black shirts. They put on fascist black shirts and parade in the streets. There are German sympathizers of the Nazis and they found a group called Friends of the New Germany. They found the, uh, found the German American Bund. Uh, and these groups become very strong, especially in um, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is rip roaring with these uh, shirt groups. And you've also got the Klan. And over time, the different groups collaborate and work together. And think about it, that creates a very scary kind of picture. If you have one little group, a nut group here, well, that's, that's a problem, that's an issue, okay. But if you have 20 and they collaborate, that's truly dangerous. And uh, quite a lot of them um, are quite well armed. Uh, a lot of them are military veterans um, and they are talking overtly about different kinds of military action within the, uh, uh, within the United States. Um, in their public statements, they're often quite uh, restrained, but when you see what um, investigators are finding, a lot of these groups are really very dangerous. And uh, particularly in urban uh, politics, there are a great many street attacks on Jews, on Jewish shops, on Jewish pre uh, premises. And the situation gets more and more serious from the mid uh, 1930s. This is a, a very interesting book. If you ever want to read a, uh, um, an interesting book about American politics, Sinclair Lewis is one of the great American authors of the century. And he wrote a fantasy, if you like a kind of science fiction novel, which imagined what happened if America fell under a Nazi or fascist movement. And his example is um, a, a thinly fictionalized William Dudley Pelly. And obviously, you know, it's a nightmare. It leads to a uh, civil war, but it makes people think. It makes people look around and see exactly what kind of dangers uh, they're dealing with. And they come to be quite, quite concerned. As the decade goes on, the economic situation gets worse. You know, we always think, okay, Franklin Roosevelt comes in, the New Deal, this makes all this wonderful progress. Well, yes, but 1937, 38, 39 are terrible for the US economy. You have all these very disaffected, disenchanted uh, people, and they're looking for a savior, somebody they can turn to. And there are several saviors. You can't throw a stone in the United States without hitting a would-be savior or a messiah. And this is a man called Father Charles Coughlin. Uh, Charles Coughlin, Catholic priest, obviously, uh, who has this radical populist message. Um, and he calls for economic justice and he uh, makes all these impassioned speeches and he supports the New Deal and FDR. And then as the 1930s goes on, he combines these ideas with blaming the Jews for more and more and more. Uh, and oh brother, does this sound familiar? So you've got this very populist leader teaching, um, uh, teaching these very controversial ideas and the media of the time tried to ban him. They tried to cancel him. And as they try to cancel him, so they stir support for him. The radio stations in Philadelphia, for example, try to ban Charlie Coughlin. And thousands and thousands of people who support Charlie Coughlin turn out to support him and to protest against the Jews. Uh, so Father Coughlin brings the idea of the Jewish menace right into the heart of uh, American politics and American urban politics. And 
Think about it. If it was just Charlie Coughlin, fine. But it's Coughlin and the German groups and the Irish groups and the clan and all these different uh, uh, groups. This is the, uh, uh, the paper. This is his um, social justice. And uh, boy, there's a, a modern word we see in a lot of the headlines. Uh, boycott forces, uh, forces the radio station WINS to cancel Father Coughlin, blame for action put on Jewish controlled advertising. This is very overt stuff. Uh, we now have a pretty good idea Coughlin probably was working with German intelligence. Um, he kept his kind of very Nazi views fairly covert, but they are uh, there. And as America moved towards war in 1940, so all these groups got together to stop FDR taking the country into war. And Philadelphia especially became an organizational center for all these uh, groups. And they, what they did, I mean, it was uh, very, um, what shall I say, uh, uh, very, very overt. Uh, they encouraged people to desert from the armed forces. Um, some of them talked about plans to sabotage. Some of them organized militia movements to rise um, against the, uh, the U.S. And there are some characters who've I, I, who I've followed with uh, considerable interest. The great organizer of the Klan in Philadelphia is a man called Paul Winter. Paul Winter is a fanatic. He's a bigot. Um, the situation becomes too hot for him in Philadelphia, so he flees to a place in northeastern Pennsylvania called Shavertown, which is not too far from uh, Hazleton. And we have accounts of what's happening in Shaver Town in 1939 and 40 and 41, and it's terrifying. He's in touch with German intelligence. He's dealing with Nazi agents. He's um, running deserters through, and he's dealing with whole networks of what we would call hate organizations, Nazi organizations, pro-German organizations. I, um, I recently talked to and did an interview with an individual who had been in his house I think in the early 60s, in his, his last days, and the house was awash with Nazi and fascist and racist propaganda. And oh, brother, if only we had those documents and those papers, but I'm sure they're, uh, they're gone now. So the years 1939, 40, 41 are, in a sense, some of the most dangerous and unsettling in American history. If you're a Jew, Going, walking through American cities. These are very dangerous uh, places. You have these great public demonstrations and you think, okay, that's George Washington, nothing wrong with that. Those are American flags. Oh boy, who are those people down below? Those are Nazis. Those are German Nazis and uh, those were in New York, but they did a, uh, an exact parallel demonstration in Philadelphia. They tried to do one in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, those are stormtroopers. Those are American German stormtroopers of the German-American Bund. And uh, I'll also tell you one interesting thing about them. Who are these German stormtroopers? Probably about 30% of them are actually Irish Catholics. Um, because many Irish people strongly support Father Coughlin. They do not like the Jews. And some of them actually have more sympathy for the Germans than they do for FDR. And so a group like this here, if I was to, you know, if I was able to reach into the screen and uh, talk to these people, some of them would be of German descent, some of them would be, uh, would be Irish. There are also Irish fascist movements and hate groups. Um, this, by the way, is what finally uh, does for the Klan. In 1940, let me say that again, in 1940, at the time of the Battle of Britain, the uh, uh, Britain might be on the verge of falling. It might be that uh, Hitler's gonna rule the whole of Europe. The German Bund and the Klan hold joint military exercises in New Jersey. Now it's in New Jersey, but the groups participating are very heavily from Pennsylvania, heavily from uh, Philadelphia. And the Klan sort of splits down the middle. 
And there are some people in the clan who are fine with this. And there are others who say, look, we may be bigots. We are not lunatics. We are not anti-American. We are not into treason. And they're the ones who in 1940 go to the house of the um, main clan leader in Pennsylvania. Uh, they burgle it. They take all his records and they uh, drive them all to Hershey with a note saying, if you're looking for some traitors, here are some good names to start with. Um, and that really is the, well, it's the end of one version of the clan. They come back in the 50s, but um, but some, some of this story, uh, some of these stories are terrifying. This is from a Shemokin newspaper in PA. Uh, it looks like Berlin or Rome, but uh, it's Yaphank, Long Island. Uh, that's 1937. Uh, it's in 1940 that they do the really big uh, demonstrations with the um, with the clan. These gentlemen are interesting. One of the most important hate groups in American history, about which very very little has ever been written, but it's the most one of the most dangerous, systematic terror groups in American history, is the Christian Front, which is a Catholic group that follows Father Coughlin. Uh, this is a photo of an exercise. It's very, very hard to get any uh, visuals. <clears throat> and in 1940, the FBI stages raids and mass arrests of the Christian Front. And their schemes are astonishing. <clears throat> uh, they're training a private army uh, to try and take over the United States, to assassinate uh, Jews, to seize gold. Uh, to uh, assassinate members of the uh, the New Deal. How much uh, truth is there in this? We're not sure, but we know the Christian Front is a is a very important, very uh, very serious kind of organization. Yeah, I'll just run through this very very quickly. Um, in 1940 and 41, America faces one of the biggest moral, cultural, intellectual debates in its history, which is whether to join World War II. To us today, it seems absolutely basic. You know, the, the Hitler is evil. The, the Americans have to uh, stop him. In the context of 1940 and 41, this turns into a great cultural divide. Should America get involved? And a movement is formed to prevent this, to keep America out, and it's called America First. America First was a very interesting organization. It included many very honorable, smart, decent people. Give you a couple of names. John F. Kennedy was a member of American First, America First. Gerald Ford was a member of America First. They wanted to keep America out of that war. It did not mean they were pro-Nazi, but it just meant they believed in America First, okay? But as time went by, America First became more heavily influenced by far-right hate groups and by anti-Semitism. And this is the, uh, the famous uh, moment, and you note know, that's WFIL, that's uh, uh, Lindbergh uh, speaking in, uh, in Philadelphia. Lin Charles Lindbergh became not only the figureheads uh, of America First, <clears throat> but he put more and more references to the Jews as the force that was leading America into war. This was music to the ears of the far right groups, of the Klan, of the Bund, of the Sovershirts, and all these. By mid 1941, uh, America First has become a tainted organization and many of the uh, sort of regular decent people leave it in large numbers. Oh, this is uh, kind of an interesting item. This is a cartoon. And uh, the point about it is uh, you have these two figures. You have America first, you're very kind of sober and decent. And you have this evil conspiratorial Nazi. Um, and these are the lads with the Siamese beard, unrelated by blood. They're joined in a manner that mystifies the mightiest minds in the land. <laughs> and the point is uh, that they're really the same thing. That America first has become a front for Nazism. And uh, one of the great people who is exposing all this and arguing about this is one of America's great cartoonists of the uh, time, who you uh, might have heard of, 
uh, uh, Dr. Seuss uh, turns out cartoon after cartoon about the evils of America First and the Bund and all these groups through uh, 40 and uh, 41. He's very, very, uh, very political. The, uh, again, um, I, I will not talk about this at, uh, at uh, uh, great length, but I'll just talk about this. The Klan comes back in the 1950s. Uh, and they come back in uh, a response to uh, civil rights. They are much more overtly uh, anti-black. And in fact, uh, not only have they drifted away from the old anti-Catholic thing, that many of them deny, and they, they believe it, that the Klan was never anti-Catholic. They don't have a great sense of their uh, own history. They try and present themselves as a uh, community group, they're a social welfare group. Uh, there are a lot of um, clan units, clan wannabes in, um, in Pennsylvania. Most of them are numerically uh, tiny, uh, very, um, very small. Whenever you see figures from groups saying that there are, you know, 52 hate groups in Pennsylvania or whatever it is, always pays to ask a question, how big are they? And a lot of them are basically two men and a dog. Uh, there are a couple of larger groups, but <clears throat> but um, there are other groups. And I just want to talk about the impact of a couple of books in influencing hate groups from the 1970s right up to the 2020s. And this is a matter of uh, some sort of personal investment to me. <clears throat> this is a cover of the most influential American terrorist manual. I began publishing on it uh, in the early 1990s. So uh, it and I go back a long way. Every couple of years, uh, the media rediscover it, and I cough politely and say, yeah, you know, been there, done that. Um, the Turner Diaries was written by a man called William Pierce who, uh, there's a pseudonym there, who was a very overt Nazi and Hitler devotee. And he was an engineer. And he wrote a book, which is a science fiction book about how a Nazi movement in the United States in the next 20 years or so leads a revolution that takes over the United States, kills all Jews, kills all blacks, sets up a perfect Nazi state. And at every point, when you read the book, it's not just, this is nasty stuff. It is page by page, how to do stuff. If, if, when you've read the book, you know how to sabotage the Houston Ship Canal. When you've read the book, you know how to put, use a truck to destroy a large office building. The description in here of the destruction of the FBI building in Washington, fiction, is used detail by detail in 1995 to destroy the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Uh, <laughs> that was the day I had the FBI at my door saying, can you please advise us about this book? Can we borrow your copy of the book? We can't get one, certainly give it back. They still haven't. Do I, do I hold a grudge? Not at all. Um, but the Turner Diaries is the gift that keeps on giving. Incidentally, it, uh, uh, it ends, and there's a spoiler here, <clears throat> with the uh, the hero uh, crashing a suicide flight into the Pentagon. Um, not that that gave anyone any ideas. By the way, the uh, a lot of Islamist groups also read it and get ideas from it. The, um, if you organize a hate group, you will be infiltrated, you'll be under surveillance. So what you do is you act in individually. You go to the internet, you read this book, you get all the directions uh, you need, and you form very decentralized groups, which is what you, uh, you have now. Uh, all the media know about Turner Diaries. What they have not yet discovered, and I warn them about this every five years, and they ignore me, is the other book that William Pierce wrote, which is called Hunter. And Hunter is a book for lone guerrillas and terrorists. We're not members of hate groups, they are individual terrorists. 
and they carry out individual acts. Uh, they might, for example, in this fictional novel, go out and shoot down mixed race couples. They might carry out massacres in synagogues. Um, and because they act individually, there's no way they can be traced or placed under surveillance. Hunter is by far the most influential book on among far-right terrorists. It is the, far, uh, the most influential in hate groups generally. And if you look for references to it in the media, you'll find virtually none. Uh, it appeared in, gee, what, 1987 or something. I published on it a fair amount. Most people have never heard of it. Oh, a little story. <clears throat> <clears throat> when the revolution starts in Turner Diaries, the, uh, the far-right terrorists in Washington go to where they've stashed all their uh, weapons ready to start the revolution, and they've stashed them in the wood just outside a place called Belfont, Pennsylvania. So there is a, a Pennsylvania uh, angle there. And uh, if you want to see how acts like this can travel, from the pages of fiction to the real world, then you go back a couple of years and you look at the atrocious massacre uh, in the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I was, I suppose, rather complimented uh, uh, after this. The, the magazine, The Tablet, invited me to write about this. Um, and of course, that was another option to say, well, if you want to know the origins of this, uh, pay attention to books like Hunter, and uh, which, which people really uh, still have not uh, got. Uh, so to pull this together, Pennsylvania is a very important state in every way in uh, American politics, American uh, society. It's inevitable then that it is going to have its uh, political movements of different kinds, extreme right, extreme left. It has a very long and active movement of hate groups, of groups that are destined uh, to uh, combat, to stigmatize, to attack minorities of different kinds, whether uh, religious or racial. If you pay attention to this, you can see amazing long continuities of place and people. These things do not just kind of show up randomly. You can see the same ideas. Uh, it, it, it's almost as if you have individuals who in one year will wear a clan hood, and five years later they'll be out in German Bund costumes, and five years later they'll be uh, demonstrating for America first. And you can see them all the way through, and then it's their sons and their grandsons uh, in, these, uh, in these later movements. There, there are these long uh, trajectories uh, there. And if you want to know why it is important to, uh, uh, to know about this, I will tell you very simply, uh, terrorism is very unusual. If somebody robs a bank, then you go out and arrest the people who robbed the bank and you've done something good. It doesn't work for terrorism. You have to prevent terrorism before it happens. And the only way to do that is to understand the ideologies and structures and organizations of the movements that are carrying out the uh, terrorism. And the only way to do that is to appreciate history, not to back project what we have now and assume it always uh, was there, but to look at these deep origins, these deep uh, sources. And you know, I'm I'm going to uh, pull to a uh, a close at that point, and I'm very open for any kind of uh, questions that uh, people have. And obviously, you know, we're not a uh, large group, so do feel free to participate. Um, over to you, Tiffany. I can't hear anything right now. Might you be on mute? How's that? Is that better? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, appreciate. I appreciate that. I I do have a question. Um, well, actually, a couple questions that were uh, submitted to me by um, the woman who was interested in coming and wasn't able to come. Sure. Um, but she is wondering about concrete 
avenues that we can, um, you know, implement and general as a society, but also as an individual on an individual level, things that you can um, do every day if you are encountering people who are, you know, involved with a hate group or have relatives that are involved in hate groups and they're thinking, you know, um, what what their own personal beliefs are, uh, you know, what what are some things that we can actually proactively do? Why? Well, um, the first thing, of course, is to be you know, very careful with the uh, uh, how we use a term like uh, uh, what like hate group. What exactly do uh, we mean? You know, if um, uh, hate groups are often um, so far kind of underground these days, and the fact that somebody expresses an opinion that you know you may radically disagree with doesn't put them in the uh, uh, the hate group um, uh, uh, category. Um, I think that it's uh, very important to draw a distinction between expressing unpopular or uh, ugly views and views that are actively um, actively threatening and uh, uh, actively associated with potentially uh, criminal or uh, or violent uh, acts. Um, and as I say, the, the most important thing is to head off uh, acts like that before they uh, they occur. I never get too worried about the odd uh, flyer and uh, th things uh, like this because uh, the, 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 these are often the work of like very isolated individuals. I doubly do not get so alarmed about things you may get on the internet. You'll get these sort of letters going around uh, which look as if they are absolutely crazy, uh, you know, their clan or whatever. 95% of those are circulated by uh, Russia uh, just to create dissension and disagreement in the, uh, in the United States. So, you know, it, it, it's a sort of case by case thing. You know, it depends what the, the individual is. I absolutely would not give like a blanket, uh, blanket rule. It's, you know, define it and uh, determine whether you're dealing with something that is a really dangerous uh, situation. I think it's very difficult to know when you have a dangerous situation these exactly. days. Yeah, I think I think that's why we're um, asking these kinds of questions right now. Yeah. Um, I I find that uh, as a person, you know, just a regular white person from Bradford County, I have difficulty even acknowledging, you know, that that this this is a problem that I've lived with my whole life. I mean, I I can take a step back and acknowledge it, but um, to to put myself in the middle of it is still a little bit difficult, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very biased on the topic, but this is why, uh, this is why we have history. Um, and I would say the best argument for doing history uh, is that everyone knows history, but most of the history they know is probably wrong. Uh, so the, 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 they have ideas of, you know, how things developed, how Pennsylvania was and so on, but often that's based on stereotype. And when you, you look back at, uh, you know, the, these, uh, the, these worlds, it's very interesting to see how many of the concerns, obsessions we have today go back a long way. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to assume that um, a lot of our concerns about media today and control of media and censorship are entirely distinctive to us. But no, nah, they're, they're very strong in the uh, uh, 20s and 30s and uh, the whole language about cancelling and so on. That was very interesting to have that word appear right on, in the headline. You know, it's just an just interesting way of looking at it. Um, I, I did have a question. Um, in your your chapter on uh, the extreme right in Pennsylvania since 1945 in your book, which I have here, um, yep. you conclude by saying that American fascism is now extinct. And I realize this is, you know, 1997 is 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Do you still feel that way about American fascism? Or Yeah, um, I am very, very uh, cautious about the word um, fascism. For me, the word fascism is a particular set of... Um, uh, ideologies, it's associated with particular movements, which I don't even think are possible in a you know, contemporary 
uh, technological uh, world, they assume a whole set of um, structures which really did not survive the 20th century. Now, having said that, I can point to extremist movements of different kinds that are absolutely deadly, dangerous, and uh, you know demand uh, full official intent, uh, investigation and attention. Uh, but I, I'm very, very cheery with the, uh, with the word uh, with the word fascist. Uh, it's, um, historically, you know, do I think the Klan, as it existed in the 20s, 30s, 40s, was a fascist movement? Yes, absolutely. It fits every possible uh, category. The guy who carried out the attack in the uh, Pittsburgh uh, synagogue, I would probably call him. Uh, I'd call him an extremist, an anti-Semite, a fanatic, I would probably call him a neo-Nazi. I don't like the word fascist. I, I tend to stay away from the word fascist. Okay, it's interesting. Did um, anyone else have any questions? There was just a comment that there had been a, yeah. a cross burning um, here locally in the 1970s from, from oh, yeah. Jeffrey Dan. Yeah. So we do have some local connection to it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop screen sharing. I don't think I'm going to vanish in a puff of smoke, but let's see what we can do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. Are you also aware of uh, activity in Binghamton, New York? I understand the Klan was very active there. Uh, what sort of period are you talking about? Um, 50s. Yeah, I would not be at all surprised. Um, yeah, you certainly got uh, uh, cross burnings. Um, Again, there's, there's kind of a long uh, story there. There was uh, a lot of clan stuff in the 50s and uh, early 60s. And there was one particular uh, individual who was this very kind of, uh, you know, symbolic, charismatic uh, figure in the Pennsylvania clan. Uh, it turned out that he was all the way through um, a double agent for the, uh, the FBI. Um, and it, uh, you know, was very, very hard to tell uh, who was driving what at, uh, uh, at different times. Do I know Binghamton specifically? No, no not particularly, but uh, a lot of miscellaneous crime activity through the 50s, 60s, uh, really went underground thereafter, and then uh, really was brought back through things like, um, uh, like Turner Diaries and so on, uh, and uh, it's... Um, uh, uh, its movements. When did the Turner Diaries come out? It was published in parts in 1975-6 and I think it came out as a book in 78. Okay. And uh, the, there's sort of a sequel there. In 1984 uh, a group of extremists tried to put it into action. Um, they formed a group called The Order which is the name of the Nazi group in the Turner Diaries. And they carried out a lot of uh, murders and armored car robberies and so on. And there was a quite a widespread uh, counter-terrorist campaign in the U.S., particularly in Western states. And they finally tracked down and arrested or killed uh, the leaders in 84, 85. But if you think about it, you know, that's not that long ago. No, it isn't. Um, and uh, a bunch of them, by the way, were former members or former supporters of the Silver Shirts. So you have these kind of long... Uh, Long continuities. So I guess it begs the, begs the question that this is something that could happen like right under our noses in the community and we wouldn't necessarily be aware that it was happening. Is that correct? Or? You know, these days, okay, there are two sorts, if you like, of potentially terrorist group. They're the ones that I don't worry about, who are the large groups and you see them and they've got 50 members and they meet regularly. And I'm not worried about those in the slightest because you know they're under so much uh, surveillance and they can't do anything. And if they try to do something, they're gonna be arrested immediately. And then you've got groups who are couples or individuals who spend their time on the uh, internet and they learn this stuff and you will know nothing about what they're doing until they walk into a synagogue with a rifle. Or, you know, I, oh boy, I'm trying to avoid pressing too many panic buttons here, but the, the, some of these far right movements of the 80s really were very interesting. 
Um, they were very interested in access to um, biological warfare. Uh, some of them were trying to obtain a uh, plague. Um, th they were, you know, quite, <laughs> quite serious in some of the weaponry they were, they were trying to uh, get, uh, uh, get hold of. Um, and it, so it, the point I'm trying to make is that some of the, uh, the most dangerous uh, groups are the ones you, don't, you really don't see. And if they're clever, you won't see them until until they do uh, until they do something, and you look at some of the um, Islamist uh, terror attacks that are carried out by a lone individual or a couple of individuals, and people say we we never thought there was anything strange about these people. If they're members of large organizations, that's great; they're under surveillance. So um, it's hard for you or for me, but it's very very hard for the FBI. Yeah. You know, unless you want to put it like this, if they go out of their way to uh, track what everyone's viewing on their computers and what they're searching in Google, then we're all in trouble. You know, the amount of terrorist material I've searched through the years has been enormous. <sighs> but I'm doing it as research. How do you tell that? Yeah. Well, you, you know that you're, you're on their list already, so I guess you didn't have to wonder that. It's... That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Do anyone have any other any uh, questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no questions. <laughs> I will tell you one um, interesting uh, story, which kind of brings worlds together. In the nineteen uh, nineties, there was a man who was a um, uh, an Arab student in uh, Colorado, whose name was uh, Anwar Al-Awlaki. Uh, and while he was in the US, he, um, he subscribed to various uh, um, magazines and sources. And one of the books he undoubtedly read was Hunter. And he later became the uh, main propagandist and uh, organizer of Al Qaeda at the time when Al Qaeda started using all these devices and methods from Hunter uh, for the Islamist cause. So there was a direct link from a neo Nazi book to this uh, Islamist uh, cause. I think I'm the only person who's ever written on that, but it wow. is kind of interesting. And I think mm -hmm. Al-Awlaki Al 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 was uh, taken out by a drone attack and assassinated. But uh, mm -hmm. if, if you ever read the worst thing on the internet, what's the worst thing on the internet? Uh, it is the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda's magazine, Inspire, which will tell you how to carry out killings and assassinations and terrorism. And they've obviously read Hunter. Oh, wow. So we, can we be sure that if we visit that website, we are on the FBI's list somewhere, or is that you, not you the You probably kind? wouldn't get there. You probably wouldn't no. get there. Okay. I, I was once in an Asian country, and I, um, I mentioned this, and I mentioned, uh, you know, that I got something off that website. And the guy who was a local police chief said, if you did that in this country, we would be questioning you so fast. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. That's some pretty deep um, surveillance happening there. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I'm not trying to put this kind of nightmare vision of uh, Pennsylvania. I can also spend a great deal of time talking about how Pennsylvania is at the cutting edge of so many, uh, you know, progressive movements. And, uh, uh, you know, Philadelphia historically uh, has at different times been the heart of Jewish America and the heart of Black America and the heart of Italian America and so on. Um, and obviously there are some rough, uh, rough patches, uh, as well as the, uh, as well as the smooth. Yeah, everywhere, I'm sure. Well, thank you very much for doing this for us. I'm sorry we had such a small crowd, but it was very informative and I learned a lot for sure. All right. Very good talking to you and, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.
Do you have a question? No. no? Okay. Thank you.